I think uh, I think that we are already recording. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening. Thanks a lot for joining us today for this amazing talk, which uh, will be about quantum algorithms for chemistry, physics, and beyond. Uh, our uh, guest speaker today is Dr. Jacob Kutman. He has obtained his PhD at Humboldt University of Berlin. His research interests are sparse representations of, of wave functions and also re real space representation of correlated second order models using multi-resolution analysis. Uh, he is also a great contributor to, to the Madness program package and currently doing his postdoc at the Matter Lab, University of Toronto, under the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Alain asper -Kuzik. So welcome and thanks a lot for joining us today, Dr. Kutman. And um, I think the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Also, thank you for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak here. Um, to all the people who are live in the talk, I actually managed to see the chat. So if you, if you don't understand anything or if you want me to go into more details into something specific, just feel free to, to write it in the chat and I will do my best to answer it. Um, on a second instance, um, a lot of the things I'm going to show you are in sometimes uh, small overviews of a project that we did. And I think all of them are actually implemented in open source code and all of them also have small tutorials somewhere online. So in case if you are interested in this, you can always find them on our group's GitHub page. If you shouldn't be able to find them and you really want to see them, also like feel free to to write me an email and just ask about it. In the same way, if you're trying something that I show you out and you figure out it doesn't work or it has been broken due to some issues. Okay, but um, I would say uh, let's start the talk. And okay, here we are. I usually like to start a little bit from a computational perspective, like if we develop in algorithms. Um, my personal background is in classical algorithm development for quantum chemistry. So like it's always a very uh, scientific computing point of view I'm taking on, but I think in a, in a very broad uh, perspective, this is probably true for uh, a much larger class of algorithm development. So like usually it's something you want to do with the computer and then you derive working equations. So in numerical physics for us, this is just we're trying to derive equations which specifically tell the computer what to do. And then you're implementing these equations and run the program in the end. So what the computer then does for you is basically a bunch of arithmetic operations. If we now go to quantum computing, the picture somehow changes because now you cannot just feed a bunch of equations to the quantum computer because it's it's not necessarily formulated in a language that the computer can understand. So you, what makes sense in that setting is to think of it of a, from a physical perspective, because what you are programming is a physical device and your actual program is a physical time evolution, no matter what you do. So here's a very simple example that really comes from scientific computing. If we, for example, have prepared a quantum state and we want to extract information about this quantum state that could live here on a set of qubits or a single qubit, what we can do is we can couple the whole thing with a second set of qubits, perform some operations here, and at some point introduce an interaction between the two sets of qubits. With this interaction, we are transferring information, which we can then later measure, and from this measurement, draw back conclusions about what we are originally interested in. And if you compare this to what physicists often do in a lab, it's very similar. So for example, you could have a quantum system in the lab, you wanna extract information uh, from the system, and a lot of the times what you do is you shine light onto the system and sees which type of light exits the system. And from this, you are deducing some uh, assumptions about the nature of the system. So if you want to then utilize a quantum computer to do a task that you're interested in, what you need to do is to design these 
interactions here, which in the lab, this is the light matter interaction, but here on the qubits, you can of course design any type of interaction that you like. And, and yes, it's true, the talk of Alva was amazing. Um, and this is also why I like, from the title of my talk, I'm kind of gonna skip the beyond part because Alva already covered that. But if you're interested in, for example, in, in explicit examples, what type of, of applications you could do, you can revisit this talk of Alba Severa Lieta on the same series here. And she gives you a very broad overview over what's happening now in near term quantum computing. And from this, you can already get a lot of ideas um, of how to design these type of interactions. Um, but so we're going to skip this for this talk here because I don't want to repeat what Alba already told in the same series. And let's continue with. Uh, computational view on the problem. As we said, like we need to design these interactions. And the question is then if you wanna realize this in an automatized framework, what are the basic operations that you need and which you operate on? And in our case, those basic operations are the so-called poly matrices, which are just two dimensional matrices um, that define you measurements but also can define your evolutions on single qubits if you want the same thing for multiple qubits what you just do is you create tensor products of those poly matrices and potentially also just a unit operation which just means on this qubit you're not going to do anything and those are the so-called poly strings and those poly strings you can then use as the basic building block in order to create quantum algorithms you can use them to define general Hermitian operators, which you can define them just as linear combinations of all types of poly strings. And every uh, Hermitian operator that you can think about is can be represented like this. And in the same way, these Hermitian operators will later define your measurements on your systems. Like if you go back to this cartoon here, what this block actually does, it's measuring eigenstates often, or in that case, eigenvalues of an Hermitian operator through the so-called quantum phase estimation. Um, but in the same way, these poly strings can also be used to define also again Hermitian operators in the same way as for the measurements, but then you take these Hermitian operators as generators of unitary evolutions. And these unitary evolutions are what what is your uh, data processing on your quantum computer? So long story short, um, these poly strings here are the elementary building blocks that you need to handle. And if you can handle them, you can realize almost any operation that you want. Um, here's a small example. Um, let's just say you want to implement a unitary evolution on a set of qubits. You can define this abstractly as this unitary operation is generated by some Hermitian operator. And this Hermitian operator then you can represent as a linear combination of these poly strings. If you have this linear combination of poly strings, then you can decompose this giant unitary into elementary building blocks, which are usually one and two qubit operators. In this case, again, like this is just exponentials defined from one or two qubit poly strings. And if you assemble these types of primitive operations, you can in principle represent any unitary you want. It doesn't really mean uh, that it's easy or like that for every unitary, you know how to design it with a short circuit or what's the shortest circuit to design a unitary operator that you want to realize. But those are the elementary building blocks that you can use. How you assemble them is often an active question of research. Um, but no matter what, it will operate in the same framework. And as you see now here, um, all of these unitaries can additionally be parameterized, where this angle here can be any real number. So each of these small building blocks are parameterized. They can be differentiated. So like you can compute the gradients of those parameters. And it can also be automatized in a very convenient way, which was pioneered by Maria Schuld and later by the people from Sanadu in the Penny Lane package. 
And this, of course, opens us uh, a whole world of how we can assemble small parameterized circuits and by gradient descent, uh, uh, optimize them to minimize the task that we are interested in. Um, the question was, if this is a theorem in the chat, um, I don't exactly know which one you mean with the theorem. If you can type it, I can tell you, but I don't, I wouldn't call any of this a theorem. It's just, a, I would more or less say it's like a linear algebra fact, but I, I don't know like what the question explicitly refers to, but if you can type it, I can try to come back to it. Um, okay. Um, so, We can use these polystrings to represent all the measurements that we want, but also to represent all the unitaries we want. And in addition, it's enough if we just use one and two qubit polystrings. This is powerful enough. I think this is actually a theorem from uh, Sovole Kitai. Um, and based on that ground, um, we built a high level environment in order to uh, test, deploy, and develop new ideas in uh, quantum algorithms, which is called Tequila. It's a software package that is uh, free to use and open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, you can download it, use it, but you can also extend it if you like or contribute to it. And the main idea behind it is that um, you can design algorithms and ideas from a very high level and all the details, for example, uh, if you design an operator like this, like the decomposition of the matrix into the poly strings and then the decomposition of the individual one and two qubit parts here into circuits, and in principle, then also the decomposition of these very abstract circuits into basic C knots and rotations, depending on which backend you use. So, like, for example, when you send this to the IBM cloud, all of this has to be decomposed into C0 operations and rotations. If you send this to a high performance simulator, the decomposition does not have to take place. All of these nitty gritty details and also how are the gradients assembled? How can the gradients be optimized? Um, how can the gradients be used by, the, by an optimization algorithm? All of this is kind of automatized in the back and you operate on the, on the very, abstract high end of this. Um, and what it basically gives you is abstract Hamiltonians. Those are emission operators which represent measurements. Um, abstract quantum circuits where you can just, for example, build elementary blocks like this with emission operators and just assemble them together. You can parameterize everything, uh, tie them together to abstract expectation values. And those you can combine in any way you like. So for example, um, you can add them together, you can multiply them, you can differentiate them. And all of this always stays the same data structure. So for example, if you add two expectation values together, it's still the same data structure as before. If you build the gradient of it, it's the same data structure as before. And this makes it easy to automatize the translation of these data structures onto different backends. Like for example, a high performance simulator or uh, the IBM cloud, or if you have access to it, the uh, Google machines or the Rigetti machines. And in the same way, since everything is automatically differentiable, all of this can also be optimized without you from the top worrying too much about how the optimization actually takes place. And this is a small example, but it's also on GitHub of how this could look like. It has no physical meaning. It's just something I randomly drew on this uh, imaginary blackboard here. Just imagine you have a Hamiltonian, which looks like this. You say, I'm gonna assemble this from this poly strings. Then I want a circuit like this with a standard gate, like the C naught, but then like a custom gate, which is defined as the exponential over this emission operator with an angle that is parameterized by this number A here, but it doesn't enter in a standard way. And then I wanna create an expectation value of this operator with respect to this parameterized circuit, but also of the exponential of the negative of the gradient of this exp expectation value to the square. 
And this is the high level tequila code that would realize this for you. And this is just in principle how this function looks uh, depending on the parameter A, which is the x-axis here. Um, the talk from Alba I'm referring to is, she gave a talk in exactly this uh, series, this uh, Hipatia series. It's on YouTube if you just search for the series and Alba's name. Uh, otherwise, I'm pretty sure Karim has the link. Um, but this is a very abstract example. Um, and in, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you some overview of some actual development examples that we did in the group using this framework and where this framework really helped us because we could focus on the actual core part of the individual project. And the first one is rooted in quantum chemistry. And as I said before, everything is automatically differentiable, but this does not necessarily mean that the gradients that are automatically compiled for you in the background are necessarily the most efficient ones. And especially in the context of quantum chemistry, uh, we realized one thing, that if we use the standard formulation of specific types of operations that are crucial in quantum chemistry, the gradient costs were very expensive. So these elementary building blocks here are so-called fermionic excitations. What they're doing is in your wave function, they take a number of electrons. So like uh, one, two, three, four, or whatever. Take them, delete them from a set of qubits and create them in another set. So like they're moving electrons around. And those are the basic building blocks of a whole family of methods, which are called unitary coupled cluster. If you're more interested in this, um, there's a recent review by Abhinav Venant and others, uh, which was just released on archive. Just search for a unitary coupled cluster from a quantum computational perspective, and you will find it. Uh, this explains a little bit more what these uh, electron excitations are. For now, just take it as it is. Um, and the problem with this is these fermionic excitations, if you translate them into the qubit picture, you have to translate them in a lot of individual uh, unitaries. If we now do the automatic differentiation here, all of these have to be evaluated twice. And in the end, we end up with a very high prefactor if we want to compute the gradient. And the prefactor actually grows as 2 to the power of 2n, where n is the rank of the electron excitation. So for example, if you want to excite two electrons in this operation, um, you will have a you will have a prefactor of 16 already. And for a lot of our computations, this was actually the bottleneck. Um, and we couldn't like, this was what made our simulation slow and not the fact that uh, we had to simulate uh, the circuits. It was really the repetitions that we had to do here. But we saw basically the problem here is that uh, we have to compile everything down to the qubit level. And once we've done this, we have lost a lot of information. So like these elementary blocks here, they don't know that they actually operate as one fermionic excitation. So the simple trick here in order to speed up things is to do the gradient compilation before we do the encoding into the qubits. And we can do this and at this level exploit the information that we have and drop this factor from two to the power of two n to a constant factor of four. And in the case of real wave functions to a constant factor of two, um, which was very nice because a constant factor of two is just, that's the, that's the minimum you have to afford if you wanna compute a gradient. If you think about, for example, if you would do a numerical gradient estimation over finite differences, you have to at least compute two points. Um, so we dropped the factor down to a level where like uh, specific gates and quantum machine learning already use these kind of shift rules and now it also works in the fermionic world. Um, uh, what was pretty cool is also that this is of course generalizable, like instead of having a fermionic excitation here, you can think about any type of high level block and you can use the same type of techniques uh, to identify in those blocks basically if you can compile cheaper gradients or not. And this is also something that came then, for example, uh, 
This directly gave us cheaper gradients for controlled rotations because they followed a different a different pattern. Like controlled rotations are usually also decomposed into elementary gates, and all of a sudden you have to differentiate two two gates. But they have the same property here that for real wave functions you can drop the you can drop the factor down. And in addition to this, it also produced uh, already some follow ups where these ideas were like taken and further improved. And the nice thing that we had this automatic framework with tequila was here really that we could focus on the actual science and then the implementation afterwards was pretty straightforward and also the testing on real life systems. And that's for that. Uh, yes, it is basically like gradient descent. So like in quantum chemistry, um, you have, of course, you have different objectives, but one of the main objectives is that you take the Hamiltonian of your molecule and then you're taking a, a quantum circuit and you're trying to minimize the parameters in your quantum circuit in order to lower the energy and get as close to the ground state as possible. And in this unitary couple cluster, these fermionic excitations are the basic building blocks of your circuit. And you can view each fermionic excitation is decomposed, or you can, you can basically view it as something like this. It's again, just a unitary operator generated by an Hermitian operator. And then we have this angle here. And this is what is optimized with gradient descent. Um, I hope that that answers the question. So like, it's just a different type of building block. Um, and if, you, if you're interested more like into these, how they look uh, and which different method exists, uh, check out the review. Um, there are some, some nice examples in there. Um, we also have in the, the actual paper here, like we developed one or two like application examples. Um, uh, how we can use those gradients to speed up some, for example, uh, adaptive circuit constructions. Um, they are called fermionic because it's it's used in chemistry. So, like what you are, what you are representing is a wave function of fermions. Like you're interested in how electrons move through a molecule, and this is why you have to do this qubit encoding. You can, for example, do this is this is really formulated with fermionic. Uh, creation and annihilation operators. And these fermionic creation and annihilation operators, they need to be translated into these poly strings, which were the elementary building blocks of the qubit systems. And there are different encodings which can do this. The, the most prominent one is the so-called Jordan Wigner encoding. But there's also, for example, Bravi Kital. You might have heard those terms. It's also like described a little bit in this review here. But this is why they are called fermionic, because it's uh, they really represent fermions. Uh, so in that case, also, yeah, this gradient compilation is really done in the fermionic picture before we translate to qubits. Uh, um, the second example was uh, in many body physics, but of course, also, uh, especially in quantum chemistry, we're often dealing with, uh, it's, also, it's, it's pretty nice that you, that you have the questions in the chat that makes it, then I don't feel like I'm talking to an empty room. Uh, pretty cool, thank you for this. Um, so, but relating maybe back to the, to the question from before, um, what we're solving is uh, electrons which are moving through a molecule and the molecule is basically just the potential. So you're basically solving an n-body fermionic problem and the, the Schrödinger equation basically looks like this. Here I formulated it as a two-body Hamiltonian in order to, to avoid having like all these sums that it doesn't look too complicated. But this would be the Hamiltonian for two electrons. One electron has coordinate x and one coordinate has coordinate y, the other electron. Then you have each of those electrons has a kinetic energy. These are these two terms which enter here. Then each of those electrons moves in a specific potential. And in the case of the molecule, this F here would just be the Coulomb potential created by the, by the nuclei. So in quantum chemistry, our molecule is really just a, a point, a bunch of static points and charges which create this potential. And this is where the electrons move in. 
And then last but not least, what you have is the Coulomb interaction between those two electrons. And this is really what, what makes this an n-body problem. Because if this part wouldn't be in here, everything would be separable. Like the electrons would just, they wouldn't interact with each other. And of course, in the n-body problem, it's not just two, but it's like more than two. And then each of those are just sums, but it's just to, to illustrate it. Um, now, if you want to map this to qubits, um, we face the problems that each of these electrons move in real space. So like they can be everything, everywhere in the three-dimensional room. And we need to discretize this somehow. And there are different ways, and I'm also going to show you like the traditional way later. But what we tried here is like you can you can try to split the task. First, you split it into a classical domain where we say we're trying to optimize a bunch of functions, which are three-dimensional wave functions that will restrict where our electron can move and where it cannot move. And these functions are often called orbitals in quantum chemistry. This is really the standard way to do it. Like most codes also in the classical regime formulate everything with these orbitals, which are one body functions. And they are then used to create uh, many body functions later. And what we could do is we can create an effective one or two body problem, which means we take our n body Hamiltonian and somehow fold it down that it's only a one body problem. And then it's again like, then it's a, a um, artificial particle basically that still has this kinetic energy, but now it moves into some potential, uh, which also depends on the wave functions of the other particles. And then you solve like an eigenvalue equation for this one body problem. What you get from this one body problems are these orbitals, which you can then use to map them onto qubits later. And this is basically, what the picture does, um, you're trying to solve these orbitals here. Then after you have determined the orbitals, you encode them into qubits. And then in the quantum domain, you're trying to solve the actual many body wave functions onto the qubits. Uh, in the future, you could then also think about that you can take this information and somehow use it in order to improve these, uh, these uh, effective one body potentials. So this is the, the high level overview and like from a high point of perspective, this is also how like 90% of all methods are tackling the problem in order to discretize real space. Um, let's go for the traditional approach first. So like what we need is we need to determine these three dimensional functions, which we will later then encode into qubits. And so basically we need to capture a part of the one body Hilbert space where the electrons can move. Um, there's one question in the chat, which is asking what type of qubit encoding is used. This is really at this point, it's unspecified. It doesn't really matter. Um, there are a lot of them, like for example, Jordan Wigner, Bravi Kitaev are like the standard ones, but there are also um, newer encodings that are different, for example, uh, from uh, James Whitfield. Uh, and, but at this point, it doesn't really matter. Like once you have the orbitals, you can encode them into qubits. The simplest one is the Jordan Wigner encoding where it's really is the qubits will represent the orbitals. So like, for example, let's say you have five orbitals, then these five orbitals are encoded into five qubits. And for example, if then the first qubit is in state zero, it means there is no electron in this orbital at this point. If it's in state one, it means there is an electron in this orbital. So this is the Jordan Wigner encoding, and this is really one to one. So like qubit and orbitals uh, mean the same. Um, okay. Uh, and the traditional approach in order to get these orbitals is basically that you take a predefined set of functions and represent everything with those functions. Um, the advantages are that uh, if you use, what, what's usually used is uh, Gaussian functions, which are then called Gaussian orbitals. And the advantages are clear that this is well established, like this has been done for, um, for decades now, 
and that the integrals resulting from these basis functions are very fast to solve. Um, one question is about what about Hartree-Fock? Um, is this better? Um, and this is actually a good question because Hartree-Fock is exactly one of those effective one or two body problems that you can use to determine your orbitals. So like, um, as you probably have noticed, like I haven't really like specified how this potential here looks. In principle, Hartree-Fock can be one of those ways. Hartree-Fock is exactly this, that is, if you take an n-body problem and you restrict the wave function to have a certain structure, it uh, reduces down to an effective one-body problem. And you could use this in order to determine your orbitals, yes. This is, for example, then how this, how this potential here is defined. And it has, at that point, not much to do with these basis orbitals. These basis orbitals are then just used to solve your Hartree-Fock equations. You can view this, if you are like, uh, in a nasty way, you can view this then as that the Hartree-Fock basically creates you an orthogonal set of orbitals. Um, but it's also, all, in some way, it's of course uh, pre-optimized. Uh, where were we? Ah, uh, um, so like the advantages are clear, but there are also some drawbacks like to the traditional approach. And the first is it's not a black box approach because you have to pick one of those predefined basis sets. And the bad thing is uh, there are a lot of basis sets per atom. So like, for example, here you have the methane atom. You could for each of these atoms, you can pick out of 400 different basis sets and you could place them here. Of course, there are combinations which are like clear that they're not useful, but in principle, uh, there are almost infinite combinations of these things. So it means it's not a black box in the sense that um, it's if you don't know what these basis sets are, it's really hard for you to, to pick the right one. And even if you know what they are, like uh, I wouldn't say that you necessarily know which one is good for which property. Like I don't, for example. Um, and Usually what the, what the recommendation is then, just take a large basis set to be on the safe side. But this means if you want to use this for a quantum approach, you will need more qubits in the end. And last but not least, your numerical error that you make by picking these basis sets is undetermined. You just don't know what it is. You would need to make an extra study in order to figure it out for your system what the numerical error was. And with numerical error, I mean the numerical error with for the real space discretization here. Uh, this is a small cartoon how this looks uh, in actual applications. So like if you want to do a classical quantum chemistry calculation, you pick a molecule, you pick a software package and an algorithm, which this you can treat as a black box basically, but then you need to pick two things. You need to pick two acronyms. First, the red one here defines more or less how your wave function is approximated. And on the right side, these are these so-called basis sets. And you can probably see why I termed it inconvenient, one of the disadvantages, because these acronyms, they don't really tell you anything. And I could also not give you like a guarantee that I would pick the right one for the right task. If you want to make this a true black box, um, for example, in quantum computing, we have, we're not at that point yet, but at least the goal is to get rid of this part here, that we have always an accurate representation of our wave function, and then we can do this automatically. But this part here will stay, the basis set part. You will still need to pick one of those. Um, and so one alternative is to do a so-called system adapted approach, uh, what we did actually in this work. And the idea is, uh, instead of picking a predefined set of functions, um, we could use a flexible numerical model that can adapt to the problem at hand. And then we combine this with a so-called surrogate potential. And for example, Hartree-Fock could be one of those, like uh, coming back to the question before. Uh, we actually did not use Hartree-Fock. We used Hartree-Fock plus a little bit of perturbation theory in order to get, um, to capture the correlation a little bit better, but this is actually something uh, where you could think of like many different things. Um, and with this, we are a little bit closer to the black box because now you don't have to pick out of the zoo of acronyms anymore. 
And now the advantages kind of, they, they turn upside down. Like now all of a sudden the advantages are you have a defined numerical error because this multi-resolution approach automatically adapts to your problem at hand. It is basically a black box at this point. Um, and on the other hand, since you are optimizing your representation, you end up with much lower qubit numbers to the, if you want to get the same accuracy that you would get with a classical basis set. The drawbacks here are that despite to the classical basis sets, this is not very well established. So it means um, there are not so many codes which can do it. And a lot of the old tricks don't work anymore. But I'm actually for quantum computing, I'm not so sure if this will be 100% true because a lot of the old tricks from classical quantum chemistry also don't work in quantum computing anyway, and we have to find new ways and workarounds for them. Um, and the other thing is that this is a comparatively high classical computational cost if you want to do a method like this. Um, but to be fair, uh, the formal scaling of these multi-resolution methods is often better than their classical counterparts. It's just that the trade-off point uh, comes uh, pretty late. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, um, this is the article uh, where we've implemented this, but there's also a high-level blog article on the group's uh, sub-stack. Just search for bits are cheap and qubits expensive and there's we tried to do like a, a high level, uh, easy introduction into the whole topic. Um, um, I have, we have new questions on the chat, but I, I can't read everything. Um, well, actually, oh, yeah, oh, it's just, you, Christian, just, you know, some documentation regarding cascade and the implementation of, uh, of different mapping techniques like the Jordan, uh, the Jordan mapping or uh, the the parity map. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just saw yeah, you 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 shared some information about the encoding questions. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, and a little bit behind the scenes, like what does actually happen here? Like just from a very high level, this is this part here is not done by Tequila. It's done by a a library called Madness. Um, which I am contributing to, as uh, Karim said, but which was not created by me. It was created by Robert Harrison from Stony Brook University. It is a very, very um, good uh, piece of code and it's insanely fast. It's probably also why it's called like this. And it's really the reason why we are actually able to do these computations because we can rely on madness. And the nice thing about it, like uh, you can basically use it as a black box, um, but just to give you a little information, what, what's happening in the background is it basically represents functions by uh, piecewise polynomials, which are only existing in certain parts of space, and then increases or decreases the resolution depending on the function at hand. So like, for example, I didn't resolve the whole thing here now because this tree would get very deep. But as you see here, the resolution increases in the middle and in principle, it would need to increase further here and here. So like this tree would level down. And this is basically what is automatically constructed in the background and used. Uh, the same thing for two dimensions is then you just have these boxes. And then we of course need to use this for, uh, for the three dimensional world in order to get these orbitals. You can also use this um, to tackle uh, to tackle uh, wave functions directly without using this uh, split the task into one and many body parts. But um, as I have done some research in this, um, I can tell you like uh, after two body, it's, it's basically over because with the two body approach, you have to resolve a six dimensional grid, which is still doable. But at this point, you really feel the cursive dimensionality kicking in. And this is why we propose to um, to use actually the quantum computer for the uh, for the many body part here. Um, okay. Um, and yeah, this is basically what we use for this classical domain. But this is just a little behind the scenes. Um, the nice thing is really that we can use it as a black box just to get our orbitals and in the end our Hamiltonians for our molecules. Uh, 
Yes, just a little bit because I because I I said later that for, before that the advantage is that you need less qubits. Um, if you were wondering what does less mean actually, like in this paper we compared the system adapted approach using madness with the traditional approach using Gaussian basis sets for different systems and different energy metrics. So like maximum and non-parallelity error basically mean um, the maximum error on a potential energy surface or the non-parallelity error, which is the difference between the minimum and the maximum error. So like this basically tells you how, how balanced your system is. And for all of those, if you use the system adapted approach, you need much less qubits than before. And here is one example, which is the BEH2. So like I did this, this should be one further down, but it, it doesn't matter actually, but um, here this is done with 12 qubits and the system adaptive approach. This is the yellow line here. And then we have the red line. This is a basis set of the same size, like a traditional one. And you can see like how much the jump is. And this lowest line here is what you would get if you would use 200 qubits in the traditional approach compared to 12. And you see with an optimized 12 qubit approach, we're getting much, much closer to this already. Um, and the last example is then, uh, if we're doing all of this and uh, we are using this adaptive basis and we're using a surrogate model in order to determine our orbitals and then use these orbitals in order to determine our many body wave functions. We probably have already a lot of physical insight in this surrogate potentials and in the orbitals that we created because we, in, a, in a sense, we are creating optimized orbitals already. And these optimized orbitals already tell us a little bit about which orbitals should be more entangled and which ones not so much. And we can exploit this physical uh, information that we have in order to compile very short quantum circuits to create uh, our many body wave functions. And this is, um, this is like a, a recent paper that we have on something that we call a separable pair approximation. So here, this is the same system as before, this beryllium dihydride. After we've done this classical pre-computation, we get these orbitals here. And I choose this system because here you can really see it from the plots a little bit that these three orbitals, they somehow belong together. As you see, like they are more like to the left side. Those are more to the right side and this just doesn't do much. And you can see like the ones who are on the left side are the ones which are basically represent this bond, the other represent this bond. And now we can exploit this by the construction of our circuits by having like a pair of electrons live ex explicitly in this domain, the other lives explicitly here and the other one here. And this is the corresponding circuit and those things can be compiled automatically which is the important point because um, it's not done that we like plot the orbitals and then think where to put the circuits. This is really, this information is drawn from the surrogate potential and then these circuits are, are created automatically. And now this whole thing becomes uh, classically simulatable because as you see, these circuits have a very specific structure. So like they decompose the whole thing into sets of qubits which never talk to each other. And in these sets of qubits, the wave functions also follow specific patterns and structure that we can exploit in order that we will not run into a memory bottleneck when we simulate them classically. Um, it means we can always use this as cheap initial states for whatever algorithm we might want to have. And for a lot of cases, it's actually that those states are already enough, like they that they capture already almost all of the correlation that is there. Um, and I mean, this was the example here with the beryllium dihydride. And you see here a little bit like how many parameters does this have? How many C naughts? How deep is the circuit? And those are other molecules uh, comparable. And you see the circuits are not very deep. For example, here, this would be a molecule with 84 qubits and it's still just a depth of 23 because we have this high structure. So it means these things can always be compiled classically and then you have an already uh, quite an acceptable initial state. Let's go back to the 
sodium dihydride, just how does this look? The red line here is actually this circuit, how it performs on the potential energy surface. And you see for a huge part, it actually captures the full correlation, which means since the circuit is classically simulatable in this part, all of these points, you don't need a quantum algorithm in order to, to solve the system. It's perfectly solved with this type of circuit. But at some point, it becomes worse. And then you need uh, uh, higher order methods here, for example, this pair coupled cluster, which is again in this uh, review by Abhinav Anand and others. Um, it's uh, explained a little bit in more detail what this is, but also in this paper here, especially since these SPA, these separable pair approximations are naturally incorporated into this. So like this thing here, the blue line is just this part plus something else with the difference that this first part here is now highly optimized and really doesn't take many gates. Uh, this was the last example. Um, last but not least, just a little advertisement uh, for the new paper of uh, Philip Schleich, which just came out today. And I don't wanna go into the details here, what was actually done, but what, what's connected to this talk is that this, uh, paper focused on something that is called explicit correlation. And in order to do it, uh, we needed everything that I've just shown you. Like we needed uh, a robust framework that automatically does uh, specific things for us, like creating these Hamiltonians, compiling those circuits, optimizing those parameters. Uh, we needed the optimized gradients, otherwise some computations wouldn't have been feasible. We needed the optimized orbitals because here it was really about going as close to the to the numerical limit as possible. And we needed like a robust uh, method that gave us uh, at least a, a decent approximation to our ground states. And here we used, could use these separable pair approximations. So all of these things were here really used in a black box fashion. And the fact that we had this tequila library, which combines all of this and gives us access to all of these methods without having to be an expert in it, uh, really made such projects possible. Um, and this of course means also for you, like if you're interested in doing some quantum chemistry uh, research, since everything is open source and available, you can of course also like try to use this and focus on some specialized aspects. Um, and if you have some cool ideas in the future, um, I feel very welcome to also contribute to Tequila and just uh, make your own branch, introduce some improvements, make a pull request or uh, let me know about it. Um, uh, we are very happy um, to have external contributions, which we already had from people in, in different uh, places of the world. Um, with this, uh, I'm at the end. Uh, I think I'm still in time. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions. That was actually really cool. And I'm happy to answer more if you want. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Um, I will open the mic for everyone right now. Just a second. Um, so, so if you would like to open your mic and, uh, and ask questions directly, that would be great. Um, Professor Yunus, um, okay, uh, there is a question from Professor Yunus. Uh, he says that, is it possible to show a real example uh, on tequila? For, for example, always, like, um, like Oh, it's very text. risky, but um, I, I think that should be possible. Depending on uh, what do you want to see? Is there any fun thing in specific or should I just like uh, do like uh, artificial one qubit? Yeah. Thing? Um, for example, like finding the eigenvalues of. Uh, okay, he, he, hello, hello, Dr. Jacob. Uh, actually, I, I I'm really interested in in in, in tequila uh, and uh, and your work, of course. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, uh, but actually, I, I'm facing some kind of of problems using tequila. This all these libraries. So, do you do you suggest someone to to consult technically uh, on how to install tequila? Oh yeah, me. That would be me. Um, okay. <laughs> we can. Okay. If you if you want, I'm not sure like if you want that on the recording. Um, but we could 
just like after the session ends officially, uh, we could just get through it. Like if anyone else is um, interested, I don't know, like if you have if you have like a specific problem, we can we can look at this. Otherwise, I could just like on my okay okay we can we can, we can install it myself for later. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, are there any questions from the audience? Anything at all? Okay. Um, no, actually, I, 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 I have a small question. Uh, so using using quantum computing to solve these problems, do, do we beat uh, scale uh, over classical quantum uh, uh, chemistry uh, because I mean the size. Is it possible to to overcome the size uh, on on classical uh, uh, computers? Uh, that's a very very <laughs> highly debated question, actually. Um, so one interesting thing, for example, was these separable pair approximations that we had before, where our so our original intent was to shrink the circuit sizes down that they were not so astronomically large like these couple cluster circuits are usually they have a few thousands of gates and that was a bit frustrating because um, we knew that this wouldn't run on any hardware currently then we reduced this down uh, with these separated pairs and in the end like we realized now we reduced it down the circuits are very short but they're also like from their internal structure they're just classically simulatable. Also, like if we blow them up to 100 qubits, it will not make them harder to simulate. Um, but of course, there are, uh, especially in quantum chemistry, there are cases which we really struggle classically, but they are currently currently hard to grasp because everything we do in development here, we actually rely on classical um, simulation because the goal was to got a an automatized library which can compile all these things for you. Um, but we can, of course, not use a real quantum computer in order to develop this because that would take too long. And also we don't have like this prioritized access. Um, so it's it's very hard at which point they will actually be large enough to overcome this. I could imagine like for some, some special cases also in like real physical simulations that could be quite soon. But for general quantum chemistry, it could still take a while. I don't want to make any bets, to be honest. But despite the whole, like, does it have a quantum advantage or not? It's in general, from a research perspective, um, it's very interesting to formulate everything in a unitary framework because it's just uh, very close to nature. That's a diplomatic answer. Okay, thank you. Um, there is another. Uh, there is like another small question from me. Uh, I have sent uh, a quick, you know, uh, just a shorthand on like a specialized molecule that I'm I'm already working on, which is uh, naphthalene tetracarboxylic dianhydride or NTCDA for short. It is used for uh, or, uh, organic semiconductors, actually, uh, for uh, creating photodiodes. So uh, the molecule is quite huge, but um, can can we, for example, uh, try to um, to uh, to use quantum computers, especially like like mini qubit gates or mini qubits, to uh, to simulate uh, its system and the uh, or to find the the eigenvalues. Uh, or the, the correct lowest eigenvalue, for example, for for such a molecule, is it is it possible or not? It's like with real hardware right now, I would say no. Like that's too yeah. small. Yeah, I I, I um, totally understand. But using madness with with tequila. Oh and also, yeah. Um, and how many so I, I know that have? tequila. Well, how many electrons? Uh, I think. Uh, how many electrons? I cannot answer this question specifically, to be honest, but I think quite too much for at least at least um, like 30 electrons and more. OK, um, 
So what is it? I think it's um, it's hard for me like to see. Um, even I'm officially a chemist. Um, it's hard for me to see the molecule in front of my eyes, but I at least know what naphthalene is. So in madness, like computing the orbitals, this is within range still. Like we did molecules that had a similar size. So like we did once we did 10, 10 carbon atoms. And I think this is below 10. For, for example, uh, we have like one, four, five, eight. Okay, so th this is like the, the structure with a planar pi stacking. Oh, is it like, is it a naphthalene and each of these like four, you have tetracarboxylate? What's the... Yeah, yeah. let me let me yeah. show you a picture of, the, uh, of it in just a second. There's more than one ring or like naphthalene is not the only aromatic compound. Just a second. Uh, I, sent, I sent the photo in the chat. Perhaps you can see it. Oh yeah, nice. Um, Okay, that's so why the, the the A is like the, the device itself or the photodiode itself, and P is like the the structure of the molecule itself. Yeah, I think like so computing the orbitals with madness, um, that should work, but it's not it's not going to be like a, a computation you can do on a laptop. But if you do it on a cluster, let's say with forty threads or something, I, that's mm -hmm. at least not impossible. But it's not something that you can do like on a routine basis. That really, that will take a while. But in principle, one can compute these orbitals. Then you have these orbitals, and now uh, let's do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, like let's say like roughly twenty-five. I think you probably will have like roughly twenty-five orbitals from this. Mm -hmm. Which means, so if you stay in this SPA regime, um, mm -hmm. it means mm -hmm. those are 25 qubits. Um, if you, in that case, that would mean you are neglecting all the core orbitals, which is always a fine approximation. Um, and you would also neglect the lone pairs of the of the oxygen, which means again, it's like if you if you're using this. Uh, Paired Hamiltonian, you are at 25 qubits, and this is still, if you're using QLEX with a GPU, um, this is still doable. Um, but again, this will, it's not a super like, easy. So, like, yeah, my, this will take a, long, a lot of time, right? My rule of thumb is a little bit um, up to 20 qubits, everything is fine, like from with classical simulations. The problem is mm -hmm. if you go larger, um, the individual. Uh, the individual simulations with QLEX, which is our fastest backend that we currently use, will take quite long. But additionally, also, of course, your number of parameters and gates and all of this goes larger. So it means you need to do more evaluations for the gradients and all of these things. Um, but of course, this SPA is, if in principle, efficiently simulatable classically. But it doesn't mean we have a high performance code for this because for the systems that we're doing, um, we just simulate the full qubit system without doing these actual exploitations that you can do classically. But in principle, that would be doable, but not out of the box. Um, and if you unfolded your red 50 is a qubits, which, uh, answer, and I do like it, and see you give me some hope on this problem, actually. So thank you so much. Yeah, but um, maybe I'm not sure. Um, what you can always do with this is because it always depends on what you want to want to do with it. Um, so what what makes sense here is probably to For just example, say that we will we are trying to find the the lowest eigenvalue of the state uh, or the system in general. That that would be like the first thing. And then uh, we should do something like uh, like changing the uh, the uh, the um, the atomic distance between between the bonds, something like this, and then we can check for uh, for the lowest eigenvalue again, so that we can you know change some of the structure of the molecule, and based on that we can check for the uh, the photoelectric the photoelectric uh, properties or the characteristics of the photodiode at the end, as like something like end-to-end -end approach. So that we can use quantum computing for manufacturing a better for that. That is what we are thinking of for now. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
what what needs to be clear is like with with all these approaches, you will currently will not have an advantage over classical methods. Like for example, if you would use classical yeah. couple clusters, that is, doubles, that is, it's probably yes. better. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to do a proof of principle calculation with this, um, I think what's reasonable here is because this is probably also the thing that is interesting in the case of the properties of these molecules is just look at the pi system, which mm -hmm. would mean then you have then you don't have 25 orbitals, you have less. I don't know how many pi orbitals this has, but um okay, I I, I totally got you on this one. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. And another another question. Um someone actually asked me before about the difference between tequila and, and penilane. And I said that tequila is more oriented to quantum chemistry problems. So is it a good answer or it's not a good answer? Uh, yeah, I think that's that's kind of true. Although like the penny lane people are stacking up on the quantum chemistry side. Uh, I would say it's it's similar in, in a sense, but it's like the implementations are different and we have uh, other like other focus sometimes for example this whole like system adapted way with the madness library this is something that we focused on in tequila which uh, the penny land people are not focusing on so like we have different like like each software package has different uh, strong sides and this is basically the difference but what's also is different is like specific ways how things are implemented and or like how you use things from the top, like the design of the API. Some things are, of course, also similar. I guess like how you assemble a quantum circuit is everywhere the same. Um, we in Tequila, we have this, uh, let me try to go back here. Um, I think I'm still sharing this screen. Yeah, that is correct. We have this framework that everything works over these objectives, which are these abstract data structures that are just a collection of expectation values. And so this is usually different from how other packages like take the approach. And then it depends like um, if this like suits your style in the way of how you think about these problems. So like I usually just think about them as a collection of uh, expectation values that are somewhere evaluated. And these expectation values I just see like as as unitaries generated by poly strings and measurements generated by poly strings. If this is like, if this abstract framework is something which you like to think in, then this is how Tequila is designed. While other packages use different approaches to this, and then it really depends on who is who is using it, how you think about these things. Um, okay, thank you. Which thank is, you. you can, for example, see with Tequila that we did not design it so much with, for example, uh, neural networks in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in principle, it has all these functionalities, like these things can be differentiated and all of this. But if you want to if you want to use it like as a node in a neural network, for example, what Penny Lane is really good at, um, it's less natural with Tequila because this was not how we thought about it in the beginning. Like. Um, but it's 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 a different way. In, in principle, you can still do it. Um, it's really like it's a matter of style in the end. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And um, I think there, there is another question. Yeah, it says, um, is it is it possible to estimate the gradient for a classical system using tequila, knowing that the system is not differentiable? Okay, um, I'm not sure. What what exactly you mean with this? Because if you know that it's not differentiable, I'm I'm not sure if there's any hope. But you, I mean, what you can always do is you can always do finite differences, uh, where uh, there you wouldn't need tequila. Like with tequila, it's um, everything you can express in this uh, unitary framework. So like technically anything, but not any problem is especially well suited for this. Let's say it like this. In principle, you could do it, uh, but um, it, it, it really depends on which classical system you mean. And it, it actually, it means it really depends on which classical system do you mean, and also which gradient, like also depends a little bit on like uh, what you are differentiating with respect to what. Um, 
everything that if you can formulate it in terms of a unitary and the unitary is parameterized, then Tequila can do it. Otherwise, it's not designed for it, I would say. Okay, thank you. So I think um, there are no questions for now. So um, thank you, thank you so much. And um, sorry. Okay, so he he says that uh, I got it. Thanks. So again, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, this is it for now. And th thank you so much for uh, for this presentation. And it's enlightening. And uh, and I do like it so much. And uh, Thank you for the hope that you gave me for uh, for uh, for my problem. Yeah, this is true. And um, did did you have anything on mind uh, for Tequila to say it uh, for the audience before we we end uh, the meeting? Uh, I I think I said anything. Like, if you're interested, uh, check out the GitHub page. There are like all the links to um, the papers. The um, like, I think actually everything I've talked about, like the papers are there the links um, there's also the links to the to the tutorials and the specific uh, tutorial codes according to each of these sections um, if you ever want to try out madness um, it's super easy to use but it's not easy to install um, although like once you you got it it's actually easy but um, it can be it can be quite frustrating if you um, I also have this on my GitHub page, but it's also on the Tequila GitHub. There's like Madness back and there's like click here to see how to install stuff. Um, and just follow this readme if you, before you like, uh, before you get best fed, uh, just write me an email. Like if you really want it, we always got it to work with most people. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so generous of you. And, uh... Thanks everyone for being here with us today. And uh, I think we should say that uh, there is a, a very big announcement that uh, that has been live for at least two days for now. It's about uh, the Young Researcher Program from Q Egypt. Uh, please spread the word and, and tell everyone about this. Uh, it's like life changing for, for many people in, in Egypt regarding the quantum computing community. So please uh, tell the others and spread the word. Uh, and uh, in the following uh, two weeks, we will have another Hepatia talk, which will be uh, on quantum hardware, specifically uh, transform uh, qubits. So please uh, stay with us and stay tuned for this. Uh, we will announce it very soon. And thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, thanks Dr. Jake. for Jake, the invitation for, for and for the mm -hmm. questions. You're welcome. You're welcome so much. Okay, uh, I will stop the recording now. So, everyone, um, bye bye. Um, about the question with the installation, so like, if you I'm want, sorry. we, I can, I can walk you guys through. Um, okay. Uh, during the the recording itself, or I don't care. Like, that's that's for you to decide. Uh, it's okay. We we will stop the I'm, recording. I'm and, uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I will stop the recording now, and then you can show us if you have the time. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.